In this video I'm going to talk about uh, one of the most basic units of a solid state image sensor which is the photodiode. Photodiode. Well, what do I mean by photodiode? Here I'm going to assume that you have some exposure to electrical engineering topics and say that a photodiode is really not much more than a diode. Let me write out, let me draw the symbol for a diode. This is the common symbol for a diode. A downward facing triangle, terminal, another terminal. And if I put a voltage across this diode, let's call it the diode voltage, the diode, I'm going to get an IV plot, oh, sorry, where this is voltage and this is current. This is V diode. The IV plot draw the axes, it's going to look something like this. And then this, this current is going to shoot off almost to infinity. It, what you have are three distinct regions of the diode. You have here, where V diode is positive, you have forward bias. Forward bias. bias. And here we have reverse bias reverse bias. That's where we're going to operate our photodiode. And then you have this point here where V equals zero and I equals zero. I forget the name for that, but that's what the deal is. Uh, like I said, we're going to operate a diode, our photodiode in reverse bias. And a, photo, a diode is nothing different than a photodiode. They, sometimes there's a, a little bit different structure in how they're built up but uh, for all intents and purposes they're the same thing. Let me scroll down and draw the situation a little bit differently how it's usually represented for photodiodes. So here the diode was downward facing but for, forward, for uh, photodiodes it's usually drawn in the reverse orientation. We have something like this, okay? Or it's an upward facing triangle. What we have uh, that that's a representation, the schematic, the symbol for something that's actually going on within the the semiconductor material. Okay, here's the semiconductor material that I'm drawing out here, and we have two regions. We have the p-type, p-type region, and we have the n-type region. I should make a note that I, in the discussion here I'm mostly going to talk about <clears throat> visible image sensing and the principles here are, are uh, applicable to visible image sensing. Most of them are also applicable to infrared sensing. Photodiodes are the most common infrared sensor too, built in different kinds of materials like mercury cadmium telluride, uh, gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide, but here I'm going to focus on silicon. silicon and use it to detect visible light. Visible light. That's what's going to dominate my discussion. This uh, photodiode, the, the, this is the basic unit for photodetectors. Not all infrared detectors use a photodiode, but most do. So I'm going to discuss the photodiode. So here in this discussion I have n-type silicon on the top and p-type silicon on the bottom. What happens? Well, when you put this two types of material together, you're going to have some depletion width. There's going to be some depletion region that grows around this junction, and it's going to start here, say, and the width, the width, this direction will depend on the doping profile. But now I'm going to reverse bias this diode. So usually what happens is you end up grounding this terminal, which means that to reverse bias it, this n-type terminal needs to go to some VDD, uh, I'm going to say in our case plus 5 volts. So you can see that this plus 5 volts and this, I'll write it as plus 0 volts, uh, results in a reverse bias diode. Because the positive, positive potential is applied to the n-type silicon and the negative potential or the, the lesser potential is applied to the p-type silicon. When you apply that potential, that depletion region will actually grow 
and let's assume that the n-type silicon, the depletion region, has grown all the way to the surface of the silicon. And let's assume that for the p-type silicon. That's not all. That's in fact usually not the case to, by, by the way that uh, photodiodes and image sensors are manufactured. But let's assume it, that we fully depleted this volume of silicon. What happens when this fully this volume of silicon is fully depleted, and we illuminate it with visible light? So let's say we have a photon coming in with some energy, some energy, h nu. Well, if it has enough energy, it creates an electron-hole pair, electron-hole pair. What's going to happen to this electron-hole pair? Well, the hole is going to be attracted to the most negative potential in the system, and that's going to be zero volt, so it's going to go there and just get sucked away to ground. The electron is going to be feel an electric field and try to go towards that plus 5 volts. And that's what happens. We have a fully depleted volume of silicon. There's an electric field and these charged particles will move according to that electric field. Now, uh, we are going to collect electrons. And for most image sensors you collect electrons. You don't worry about holes. I have seen image sensors where you collect holes, but that's not the majority of them by far. Okay, let's talk about the electron. So the electron wants to go to that plus 5 volts. And the way I've drawn it here, it's a little misleading because in an actual, if you were going to instrument this photodiode as part of an image sensor, you wouldn't connect this terminal directly to a DC power supply because then that electron would zip away into the power supply and you would never see it. Rather, uh, the, for the, depending on the kind of image sensor you have, you'll either bring that electron out and store it on a capacitor which will then create a voltage by Q equals CV, and then you read that voltage out through some sort of amplifier, or you'll store it in the pixel or jostle it around in the pixel by uh, alternating clock phases, and that'll hopefully become a little more clear later on. But the basic idea is that this electron is going to be attracted towards the most positive potential in the system, and that's uh, where we're going to read, and we're going to read that electron out of signal somehow. Okay, now, as I mentioned, this is silicon. And we're talking about the wavelength of visible light, h nu, or the energy of the visible light, h nu, okay? Where the speed of light equals the wavelength times the frequency. And you use this term to calculate the energy. What kinds of photons, what kind of electromagnetic radiation is silicon going to be sensitive to? Well, I scroll down. Let's make an uh, energy band diagram, a very simple energy band diagram. Okay, Up here we have the conduction band, and down here we have the valence band. And for energy band diagrams, whoops, didn't mean to scroll. For energy band diagrams, as we go up in the y direction, that means increasing energy of an electron. Energy of an electron, E minus. If we have, oh, and the x-axis is distance, which is partly why this makes, this is so useful, because we have distance plotted against energy. Let's say we have that photon coming in, and it interacts with the silicon. Through some interaction, it, it, uh, it, interacts with the lattice, creates phonons, the energy is somehow is transform, transmitted to the lattice. And let's say we have enough energy so that an electron that's down here in the valence band gets shot up to the conduction band. Okay, The electron's up there. Now, down here, since the electron went away, we have the absence of an electron, which we label as a hole. So based on that one photon, one photon, we have one electron and one hole that we can do something with. Now this this is a quantum efficiency of 100%. So this well, I mean the internal quantum efficiency of 100%. So one photon is resulting in one electron and one hole. Uh, sometimes you can get more than one electron and one hole per photon, and sometimes you get less statistically. But for this example, let's stick with one. Okay, how much energy does that photon have to have to excite that electron up? Well, the energy band gap of silicon is 1.1 electron volts, more or less. Okay, So that means that in order to excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, 
the photon has to have more than 1.1 electron volts of energy. What, what are allowed? What are allowed levels? So what will work? Let's say we have lambda, the color, and we have energy. And I'll try to make this discussion quick. Let's say we're in the near infrared and say that's about 1100 nanometers. I just went to an online calculator to find what that uh, energy is, what the energy of that electron that has a 1100 nanometer wavelength and that is 1.1 electron volts. So that means just barely this near-infrared photon will excite an electron to the conduction band. Now what about red? Visible red. The kind of red you see in a stop sign. That's about 600 nanometers. That photon will have an energy of about 2 electron volts. So since 2 is greater than 1.1 eV, which is the band gap, band gap of silicon, the red photon will easily excite uh, an electron to the conduction band. What about green? Green is about 500 nanometers and the energy is about 2.5 electron volt. Just go down the line. Blue is four, about 400 nanometers with about 3 electron volts and then UV starts below 400 nanometers but I'm just going to call it here about 300 nanometers and that's four electron volts. So we can say that anything this way will excite an electron to the valence band. What about if, if it was like uh, 1150 nanometers? I don't know exactly what the value is of that, but let's say it was 1.2 electron volt. Well, this 1.2 electron volts is not greater, uh, 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 I'm sorry, let's say it was 1.0 electron volt. That one electron volt is less than the 1.1 electron volt of the band gap, so that electron doesn't get excited to the conduction band. See you in the next video.